Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Together, we'll uncover secrets that only stones from antiquity can reveal. Please subscribe to the channel to show your support for this line of inquiry. That drives me to make more of this content for you. The third and smallest king's pyramid at Giza, attributed to Menkare, is a bit like a diamond in the rough. Somehow, it never managed to shine as brightly as its larger neighbors, but it still holds many unique qualities and beautiful features. After the enormous breach on the northern face, analyzed in an earlier video of mine, the magnificent granite casing stones are the next obvious feature worthy of attention. There are many questions surrounding these granite casing stones, not the least of which is why the vast majority of them were never dressed perfectly smooth. There's an old saying in archaeology that the most valuable objects for study are those that remain incomplete because the process of creation is laid bare and design intentions can be more clearly understood. In spite of this opportunity, Menkari's casing stones remain a woefully understudied and archaeologically neglected feature of his monument. As you can see, piles of fallen or quarried casing stones are strewn beside the pyramid on all sides. It's a literal mountain of priceless historical evidence that nobody has bothered to properly inspect, document, and preserve. It's as if one of humanity's oldest civilizations left out a jigsaw puzzle that nobody has ever taken the time to put back together. How the people in charge of these sites can resist or ignore such opportunities is beyond my comprehension. With that said, I don't think the casing stones should be reseated on the pyramid itself. That would be a destructive process prone to unfixable mistakes. Rather, I'd like to see them all individually cleared and seated near their found locations so that a visual and scientific analysis can take place without causing further damage. Also, dislodged casing stones that are precariously attached to the pyramid's edge would need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis to determine the best course of action. These stones look as if they might fall off the pyramid any minute, but photographs show that they have remained in place for at least a hundred years. There are many secrets that might be revealed with a thorough analysis of the granite debris, and I will touch upon some of them in this video. One mystery I'm confident we can solve without reconstructing the fallen stones is the original height of the granite casing. This image of the northern face of Menkare's pyramid is detailed enough that a trained eye can spot the level at which the granite casing ended and the Tura limestone began. Challenge yourself by pausing the video here and see if you can figure it out. Just like my video about the apex of the Great Pyramid, there is a pattern that is revealed by studying the stonework. If you're having trouble seeing it, I'll give you a clue to help frame your analysis. Instead of looking at the stonework as it was originally constructed, focus on the damage to the pyramid and look for a pattern that was left by plunderers. Okay, now for the reveal. You may have noticed that here at the 16th course, the visible damage to the backing stones is very dramatic, but above this course of masonry, the blocks are in much better shape. Let me know in the comments if you spotted the pattern or what else might have caught your attention. The disparity of damage inflicted on the pyramid is certainly due to a difference in how plunderers would have quarried the Tura limestone above the 16th course compared to the granite casing below. The Tura limestone, being much softer and prone to accidental fracturing, would have required a more delicate touch when being removed from the pyramid. However, the hardness of granite would have incentivized plunderers to chisel into the limestone behind it as an easier method of prying the blocks loose. This could have been done with a faster and more aggressive technique. Looters may have opted to simply pry the granite off the pyramid entirely, letting the stones tumble to the desert floor before quarrying them to a desirable size and cut. The relatively short distance down, combined with the hardness of the granite, would minimize accidental breakage of the stones. In my video about the great breach in the pyramid, I quote Abdal Latif, who witnessed this destruction. He describes when stones were dislodged from the pyramid, they often wouldn't shatter, but instead became buried in the sand. 
there's another clue in the pyramid masonry, which points to the 16th course being the final level of granite casing. It's that the 17th course of the pyramid contains the tallest individual blocks on the entire outer structure. Flinders Petrie made this observation in 1881, stating, quote, There is a thicker course next over this, as if some great change took place there and a fresh start was made. The 17th course is thicker than any other course of the whole pyramid, and it is followed by a course thinner than any that underlie it. End quote. Petrie also claimed to find pieces of granite casing stones still in place at the 16th course on all sides of the pyramid. I have visually confirmed granite fragments at the 16th course on the southern and western sides, as shown here. There is a famous historical account of Menkare's pyramid by Greek historian Diodorus Siculus from about the year 57 BC. He explicitly states the granite casing went up to the 15th course of the pyramid. This seems like an easy number to count accurately, so why the discrepancy between 15 and 16 courses? The answer lies in the design of the pyramid's first and bottom course of stonework. This first layer of masonry has no common baseline. It is instead laid directly on the sloping plateau of bedrock. The pyramid is made level by evening the top of this foundational course. In order to make the courtyard surrounding the pyramid to be level as well, much of it had to be dug into a trench forming a perimeter around the structure. Apparently, this courtyard was never completed, and instead it was later filled with sand and limestone debris. With the courtyard trench filled in, the pyramid appears visually level with the surrounding topography, and so it goes very easily unnoticed. Even today, there is no portion of the lowest level of the pyramid visible, and only photos of archaeological excavations reveal visual proof of the obscured bottom course. Despite the physical and historical evidence for Menkare's granite casing being quite clear, Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass state otherwise in their 2017 book, Giza and the Pyramids, The Definitive History. This book states, quote, One quarter of the original height, certainly more than 16 courses, was composed of hard granite. End quote. One quarter of the height of Menkare's pyramid is 16 courses, so I have no idea why Hawass and Lehner state that more than this number was composed of granite. They provide no evidence nor reason for this conclusion, and so the best explanation I can give is that it's just a mistake. Interestingly, Menkare's pyramid mirrors a structural anomaly in the Great Pyramid that can be seen with its casing stones removed. The Great Pyramid is visibly concave on each of its faces, with the backing stones in the center of each face protruding a shorter distance outwards. Menkare's pyramid also possesses this architectural subtlety, although it is much more visible above the 16th course where the limestone casing would have begun. Some people find significance in the pyramids appearing to be eight-sided without their casing, but the significance for me is how casing stone anomalies might reveal how the pyramids were originally constructed. One of the most uncertain aspects of 4th Dynasty pyramid construction is whether or not the casing stone layer was included from the beginning or instead added on to a completed stepped pyramid at a final stage. Menkare's pyramid having a transition between granite and limestone casing gives a unique perspective in which to judge the building technique. If the transition from granite to limestone was planned for the 17th course from the beginning of construction, you would expect the height of the inner masonry to reflect a similar change where the limestone casings became much taller at course 17. But if the inner layers match the casing stones dramatically worse at course 17, you can consider that the casing change was a last-minute decision. The great breach on the northern face with a tunnel dug by Howard Weiss in the 1800s gives a unique opportunity to measure the thickness of the inner masonry at all levels of the pyramid. Looking at layer 17, where it is most visible in the great breach, suggests this fill layer is much shorter in height than the casing stones were at this course. But a more comprehensive comparison of inner and outer layers would be required to determine if this discrepancy in size is significant. 
One of the most interesting questions about Menkari's pyramid is why historical accounts always refer to it as the Colored Pyramid or the Red Pyramid. The granite covered only the bottom fourth of the structure, yet it's never referred to as the two-tone pyramid or similar description that would more accurately reflect a red and white monument. In 1993, architect researcher Gilles Dormian documented fragments of limestone casing from Menkari's pyramid. He found traces of Old Kingdom red paint on the angled outer-facing sections. Was Menkari's pyramid entirely red after construction, with the limestone portion on top entirely painted? If so, it suggests that perhaps the original intent was to use Aswan granite for the entire casing, and the switch to limestone was a last-minute change to speed up construction. I can't help but wonder if the nickname the Red Pyramid was a tradition for Menkari's pyramid for millennia, and after the pyramids were robbed of their casing and it was no longer red, the nickname was accidentally transposed over to Snefru's pyramid at Darshur. It's not as if the modern Red Pyramid is particularly red. The inner limestone blocks are only slightly more reddish in color than any other pyramid, and it certainly didn't have red casing in its original state. It would have only received this nickname after the white Tura limestone was plundered in relatively modern times. The only portions of Menkari's granite casing that have been dressed smoothly are square sections on the northern and eastern sides. Explaining why these areas received extra attention is fairly simple. The eastern side is where the mortuary temple would have originally stood, and the northern side may have had a small chapel connected to the pyramid where the entrance lies. Many Old Kingdom pyramids have evidence for chapels on their northern faces, including the Bent Pyramid and most pyramids from the 5th and 6th dynasties. Dressing these granite stones smooth on Menkari's pyramid was about maintaining a consistent aesthetic for the interior walls of these adjacent structures. The smoothly dressed casing stones thus could not be seen when looking at the pyramid from the outside. Leaving the rest of the granite faces rough and irregular may be a somewhat philosophical question of how one defines finished work. All artistic endeavors are never truly finished. A decision is simply made at a point in time that it looks good enough to stop working. If Menkari's pyramid was entirely red and not designed to reflect the sun like other pyramids, a smooth and reflective surface may not have been considered important. Even if Menkari died before construction was finished on the pyramid, a final dressing of these stones would have been easy to complete by his cult that maintained the pyramid for hundreds of years. Finally, let's talk about all the priceless information buried in the heaps of granite debris that surround the pyramid. I've always been fascinated with how the builders weren't concerned about color-matching granite stones. You often see a few dark gray ones mixed in with the more common reddish variety. This is another variable that might prove useful in reconstructing the casing stones or analyzing the quarrying source and construction timelines. In 1967, researchers Vito Maracciolio and Celesti Rinaldi claimed to have discovered fragments of granite casing blocks dressed perfectly smooth on the western side of the pyramid. If these pieces can be confirmed, it might bring new insights about pyramid construction that I can't yet speculate on. While the granite casing stones on the pyramid are often described as rough and unfinished, many of the rounded stones have been worked to some degree. They weren't seated on the pyramid with the outer face completely untouched. Many blocks show evidence of dressing that would have occurred after they were laid in place. This stone near the entrance has two levering bosses still protruding on the bottom. But as they exist today, they are much too thin and rounded to aid levering effectively. These bosses would have protruded much more when the stone was being maneuvered, and after the block was seated, they were mostly removed. Such details may not seem significant by themselves, but they can have profound consequences when studying other blocks, like the granite leaf in the Great Pyramid, which has a very similar looking finish. There's also the question of key granite stones from inside Menkari's pyramid that have been lost due to clearing and excavation. 
Howard Weiss found two enormous granite plugging stones within Minkari's entrance chamber, and perhaps they are still mostly intact among the surrounding granite debris. Also, the granite portcullis blocks for this pyramid have never been located. But if even a small portion of one was scattered in the heaps of debris, it would probably be easy to validate. It's likely that such stones would have gone unnoticed by previous excavators because there is so much granite within Menkari's pyramid. They would not have stood out the way Khufu's granite portcullis was able to. Menkari's portcullis is crucial to understanding the design of every Old Kingdom pyramid that came after, so finding a piece of it would be an enormous discovery. There's just no telling what other valuable clues might be hidden in plain sight, unnoticed in the sea of granite fragments that are scattered about. Our understanding of Old Kingdom civilization is still so fragile that a single block, even a single cut, might rewrite history. It will be my pleasure to demonstrate in future videos exactly how the smallest details can change our understanding of this amazing history. Let's hope the Egyptian authorities learn to appreciate this evidence and finally give Menkari's granite casing the attention it so very much deserves. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Please subscribe to the channel to see more of this content. Give a like or comment as you see fit. And above all, remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granite.